Hey y'all, welcome to our Calculus 1 Math 1321 here at Baylor. 15 minute or under recap video of the class. So this is following Ergowski's fourth edition calculus textbook. So that is what we are doing. And we're gonna start off with section 2.1, which is all about instantaneous rates of change as well as the average rates of change from which we define the instantaneous rate of change. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. So the very first thing they're going to want you to know in section 2.1 are these two functions right here. S of t classically stands for position at time t. You plug in a time, it gives you where you're at. V of t stands for your velocity at time t. Now it turns out these two functions are going to be intimately related, we'll get to that later, but for right now we're going to want to just kind of get used to understanding them. Now calculus in large part was developed in order to help prove physics, so that is why we're interested in both position and velocity. Later we'll be interested in acceleration, which is kind of related to all three of these. Now we're going to have this notion right here, delta s and delta t. Anytime you see the letter delta or the triangle right here, think change in. So delta s stands for change in position, whereas delta t stands for change in time. Now I have a question for you. If I tell you that you ran 200 miles in four hours, dang you're fast, do you know exactly how fast you're going at every single instant? Well, no. You could have been running some of it, you could have been walking some of it. However, if you covered 200 miles over four hours, I could tell you that you were going 50 miles per hour. And I could also tell you you're probably a cheetah because that's not human speeds. But this does get us to the notion that they're wanting to cover in 2.1, which is that of average velocity. You were going an average of 50 miles per hour. It doesn't mean you're going 50 miles per hour the whole time. So that is a distinction they make here in 2.1. Now, as we just computed, 200 miles divided by four hours gives me a miles per hour, which was our average velocity. That's exactly what we're gonna do for math. Now, 200 miles represented the total change in position, whereas four hours represented the total change in time from hour zero to hour four. So average velocity is just change in position over change in time. Now, within this section, they're gonna oftentimes give you a time interval, some number t naught to some number t one, so zero to four hours in the last problem. In order to compute the average rate or the average velocity, if you're given a time interval t0 to t1 and a position function s of t, what you need to do is to use the formula average velocity is change in position, which is given by s of t1 minus s of t0, your initial position and your starting position, or excuse me, your initial position and your final position, your terminal position, and divide that by change in time which is t1 minus t0. In the previous problem, this would be mile 400 minus mile zero, giving you a total, or excuse me, 200 minus zero, giving you 200 miles, divided by hour four minus hour zero, giving you a total change of time um, for four hours. This is the main formula from the section. Terminal position minus initial position divided by terminal time minus initial time. Quick example, let's find the average velocity over the time interval from one to three if position is given by t squared minus two t plus one. Well, to find the average velocity, we remember our formula. I'll actually make an equal sign right here. S of my last number minus S of my first number, meaning I'll plug those into my equation, divided by my last number minus my first number. Now the bottom is nice and clear to do. All that is, is two, the total change in time. So yet again, you could do change in position over change in time if that rings with you clearer. Now the top, we have to do some number, number plug-in. If we plug in three to our function, We'll get 9 minus 6, or 3 plus 1, gives me 4. If I plug in 1, I'll get 1 minus 2, so negative 1, plus 1 is 0. 
So four over zero, four minus zero divided by two better give me an answer of two. Now if my new position was given in meters and time was given in seconds, I could attribute the units of meters per second to my answer. And that's how we go ahead and compute the average velocity over a given time interval. Now let's return to you as the cheetah running 200 miles in four hours. This could be represented by this position function along this time interval. Notice if you plug in zero, you'll get position of zero, you're starting. And if you plug in four, while it takes a little bit more number crunching, turns out you'll get a final position of 200. This would, in fact, give me an average velocity of 50 miles per hour, just like we said last time. But now that we have a specific position function, is there a way for me to compute the instantaneous velocity at maybe hour number two? It turns out there is. But to do that, we're gonna to need to go back and see what average velocity really stood for when it comes to graphs. Now I've had to go to a simpler example just because I don't have a lot of room on the board, so let's stick with t squared as our position function. Now I've went ahead and graphed t squared. What I want us to do is to be able to find the average velocity on the interval zero to four. Well, if we remember our formula, this will just be S of your final number minus S of your initial number divided by your final time minus your initial time. Now conveniently what I've done is I've went ahead and said what S of four is. You could just plug in four to your function to get that 16. S of zero, well that's just zero, zero squared. And then four is still four and zero is still zero. Now we could simplify this all out and get an answer of four, 16 divided by four. Now the thing I want us to draw attention to is this looks an awful lot like something that we've done before. Notice S of four and S of zero is kind of a change in Y coordinates. Whereas four minus zero is kind of a change in X coordinates. Now what is change in Y over change in X? Turns out that's just a slope formula. In particular, it's the slope formula of the line connecting the two points. The two points in this case being the point zero comma zero, which was our initial point, and the ultimate point of four comma 16. Right here, right here. So really what you were doing is calculating a slope of the line connecting the points. Now, to get some terminology to, to, to that line, what we'll call this line is a secant line. All right, so here's the setup. We got a position function, f of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x squared, and now we have two points at t equals 0 and t equals 1 and a half. So what we're going to do, if we go ahead and calculate the slope of the line connecting these two points, is we're going to get the average velocity. Now, notice what happens. We're trying to define this instantaneous velocity at a time t equals zero. One thing that we can do is start getting closer and closer and closer approximates. So if I move the time interval now from zero to one, notice the slope of the tangent line is now negative. As I get even closer, maybe zero to a half, Notice that we're better approximating the slope around t equals zero. And ultimately, as we keep getting closer, as we keep shrinking the time interval around the point we care about, t equals zero, we end up on this horizontal line. Now this horizontal line is what we're gonna call the tangent line. And it is just the limit of these secant lines. It's what all these secant lines end up tending towards. Now, in particular, it's what these secant lines tend towards as our time interval shrinks to zero, as we just land on top of the point we care about. Well, since we're limiting in on this line, and the slope of each of these secant lines is the average velocity, we'll define the instantaneous velocity to be the slope of this tangent line. So how we're gonna get the slope of the tangent line 
is we're going to go ahead and limit in on it by letting the time interval shrink to zero and see what happens to each of these secant lines and what their slopes approach. Now, as you just saw in that video, all of those secant lines, as we let our times get closer and closer and closer to the initial time, they kind of limit down to a line that looks like the best fit slope line. Now this limiting process will be how we get the instantaneous velocity. So the instantaneous velocity at a point t naught is going to be this limit as our change in time grows closer and closer to zero, so as points get closer and closer together, of our average velocities, change in s over change in t. Now this is way too general. If we're actually given a point t naught, what we really want to do is take the limit as t1 gets closer and closer and closer to t naught. So for instance, if you're trying to find the instantaneous velocity at two, what we're trying to do is let t1 get as close to 2 as we like of s of t1 minus s of t0 over t1 minus t0. That is going to be your instantaneous velocity formula. So let's go ahead and work out an example. Now let's actually try an example where we're given a position function of s of t equals t cubed minus 3t and an initial velocity, or initial time, excuse me, of t naught equals 2. Let's find the instantaneous velocity at that time. Now, what we're going to do is take a limit of the average velocities as our time interval shrinks around the point t naught equals 2. So, a table tends to help. Let's go ahead and list that. Now, over on the left-hand side, I'm going to be listing intervals, t naught up to t1. t naught, our initial time of 2, so we can actually go ahead and replace that if we want. Up to t1, which we're going to let get closer and closer and closer to 2. Now, on the right-hand side, what we're trying to do is see what the average velocities tend towards. So, on the right-hand side, I want my average velocity formula, s of t1 minus s of t0, t0 is 2 in this case, divided by t1 minus t0, which is yet again 2. Now, it's kind of helpful just to go ahead and simplify this since we're going to be doing a bunch of number plugging and chugging. So if we want to find s of 2, that might make our life a little nicer. So if I plug in 2 to this, I get 8 minus 6, turns out I get 2. So really what we're doing is s of t1 minus 2 divided by t1 minus 2. And do not think about canceling those things. They do not cancel. Okay, now where are we going? <laughs> Maybe we let our first t, t1, be uh, 2.1. Let's start close to 2, and let's give ourselves room to shrink down towards 2. Well, if I were to plug this into my formula, s of 2.1 minus 2 divided by 2.1 minus 2, turns out I end up getting 9.61. So not too bad of a start. If I were to shrink getting closer and closer to 2, maybe to 2.01, I would yet again plug in t1 to this formula, s of 2.01 minus 2 over 2.01 minus 2. That would give me the answer of 9.0601. So notice we're getting closer to 9. Last but not least, as far as from the right hand side is concerned, meaning I'm taking numbers bigger than t0. 2 to 2.001, well, we kind of know what we're expecting to get, maybe something close to 9, is s of 2.001 minus 2 divided by 2.001 minus 2, which ultimately gives me an answer of 9.006001.
Now, I did not know that off the top of my head. Clearly, I was using a calculator. Therefore, based on just this information, we can assume that the instantaneous velocity at t0 equals 2 is 9. And that could be our answer. Now to further justify this, what would probably be, or what would actually be beneficial would be to compute what happens if I get closer and closer to 2 from the left hand side. So go ahead and pause if you needed to on that stuff. But what if instead, I'll just go ahead and erase it all. Ugh. What if instead I use the interval, let's say 1.9 up to 2. Now, yeah, I kind of get some reorderings going on up here if we want to keep everything from right to left and I think I'll get a bunch of angry comments if I don't. So really remember this formula right here. T1 up to 2 this time would be given by S of 2 minus S of T1 over 2 minus T1 which as we said last time, we know what S of 2 is, simplifies to 2 minus S of T1 over 2 minus T1. If we plug in 1.9, and don't mind me getting my cheat sheet up, we end up with the answer of 8.41. And if I get closer, 1.99 to 2, I get the answer of 8.9401. Now clearly I could keep going, I could keep letting 1.9 get closer and closer to 2, but we see the writing on the wall that this number is tending towards the answer of 9. This is generally good practice to go and do getting closer and closer to 2 from both sides. That does it for section 2.1. The main topics covered in 2.1 were the average velocity if given a position function and an interval of time, as well as the instantaneous velocity if given a position function and an instant of time like the last problem, t0 equals 2. Now the main reason we want to start here is to first off say, hey, calc really is buried within physics and it's the foundations of physics. But secondly, it teases the idea that we're going to be talking about in chapter 2, which is the notion of limits. How do I take something like average velocity and gather information like an instantaneous velocity by kind of shrinking down and observing what happens as we approach certain values? That whole study of what happens as we approach things is going to be the idea of limits, which we'll start to dive deeply into in the next section. Until then, I'll catch you all later.